Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Good afternoon to all of you. Cher Anthony, c'est Dear Anthony, avec un, un grand plaisir it gives me great pleasure to receive Paris, you here in Paris. As you know, France is deeply attached to the alliance that unites it to the United States of America. Within the framework of NATO, um, as we're celebrating its 75th anniversary, as well as in the context of our bilateral relations. For some two and a half centuries, we've always stood together in all uh, fights with the United States of America for freedom. The United States um, knows what it owes France, but I can tell you very concretely that we in France here, uh, France knows as well what it owes um, the United States in its history. In this year of the 18th anniversary of D-Day, we will have other opportunities to say it forcefully, um, to celebrate um, the friendship between the United States and France um, on the 8th of June. And it is also this uh, spirit of freedom that drives us and that led us to support Ukraine together. As you know, ladies and gentlemen, for two years now, Russia has been waging an unjustifiable aggression against um, a free and sovereign country. And not content with um, oppressing his own people, Vladimir Putin is trying to subjugate the Ukrainian people. But there are two obstacles that have been preventing him from doing so for two years now and which are making um, his war a failure for Russia. First of all, the bravery of the Ukrainians, uh, who for two years have been uh, fighting the massive assaults of the Russian armies. Um, and today, although um, Ukraine certainly did not seek this war, um, they have um, done everything to avoid it, as a matter of fact, and they still intend to fight it. Um, this fight is one of uh, self-defense, um, which is guaranteed by the UN Charter. It is a just struggle. Um, on the occasion of the meeting of um, NATO, the ministerial meeting tomorrow in Brussels, and we shall yet again intensify our support to Kyiv and send across a clear signal of our determination. The conference held in Paris on the 26th of February was a clear step to that effect, and we're concretely implementing the decisions uh, taken within the context of a number of coalitions that cover the needs of uh, Ukraine. Together with the United States, uh, dear Anthony, we are co-chairing the coalition on artillery, um, within the framework of which we are uh, implementing part of our initiatives. In order to weaken the support in Russia, and I said it on many occasions here on, um, on at press conferences, Russia is resorting to lies and to manipulating our public opinions. Um, Russia finances interferences um, and also um, is promoting false media. Um, it accuses Ukraine and Europe of crimes committed by others, recently um, um, Daesh. And it is a crude way of concealing the fact that uh, Russia has chosen the wrong enemy uh, by ignoring Islamic terrorism on its territory. And we in Europe um, um, will be determined uh, to fight this propaganda. France um, will uh, soon be proposing a um, regime of sanction dedicated to those who support um, Russian companies of disinformation, destabilization of our country and of and of the whole European continent. It is a French proposal supported um, um, and implemented uh, by the 27 member states. Dear Anthony, we talked about the Middle East, and please allow me, uh, first and foremost, to express our firm condemnation of the Israeli strike that led uh, to the death of seven humanitarian personnel um, of um, the um, um, NGO uh, World Central Kitchen. Um, the um, protection, the situation, humanitarian situation is disastrous and is worsening day after day, and nothing justifies such a tragedy. In this context, all uh, decisions taken by the Security Council shall be implemented, including Resolution 2728. And what does it say? Well, it says that all hostages must be um, released immediately and without conditions. 
that all civilians must be protected and that uh, massive humanitarian aid uh, should be uh, delivered. And in this context, I had a chance to present um, the French initiatives at the Security Council to the Secretary, um, uh, General Secretary. Um, we need to work on a two-state solution based on just and sustainable peace between Israel and Palestine. Um, based on um, security guarantees on both sides. And I have found our discussions to be constructive. And over the next few weeks, I will continue to work um, um, and advocate all of this uh, with um, uh, all the stakeholders in the region and the permanent member of the Security Council. We shall also avoid um, any regional escalation. I have in mind uh, Lebanon. Um, France made uh, proposals that were favorably received by our our Lebanese partners, and I will continue to talk to all interested stakeholders. And all stakeholders shall um, prevent any escalation. We also talked about uh, the war in Sudan. This is um, one of the worst uh, humanitarian crises in the world. And on the 15th of April, we will organize uh, a large humanitarian conference in Paris, co-chaired by France, Germany, and the European Union. We need to mobilize in order to um, work on this major crisis, which is being forgotten by the media and the political um, um, uh, leaders. Stuff. Um, and I know I can count on you um, and on the United States, the Antony, to promote and make sure that this conference is a success for the um, um, people in need. Lastly, we talked about uh, uh, Armenia's territorial integrity, which is being challenged by Azerbaijan today. And let me tell you how worried we are, uh, given uh, the fact that the rhetoric of Azerbaijan is getting out of hand. And uh, we see an increasing number of uh, fake news as well coming from Baku. And they tend to blame Armenia for the responsibility of an escalation, even though Armenia is probably the only one willing and trying to avoid it in this part of the the world. And I can see in all of this uh, propaganda uh, many uh, common um, elements if you look at what is uh, um, Russia is imposing on Ukraine. And Diantony, I think we shall uh, pay extreme attention to that, uh, six months ahead of uh, COP29 in Baku. Uh, dear Secretary of State, um, this is um, a, a short introduction. I'm looking forward to uh, further discussing these matters in Brussels and in the coming weeks. There is so much uh, we still need to do so that the values, which are founding values uh, for our, both our countries, can prevail um, around the world. Dear Anthony, thank you for these discussions. So I'll now leave you the floor. And once again, thank you very much for the quality of our discussions. I am uh, truly delighted, as ever, to be in Paris. And, uh, Stéphane, I would like to thank you for this uh, warm welcome and indeed for this uh, important conversation and I do believe quite constructive. If I may be allowed, I'll continue in English uh, for my colleagues. And as I just said, um, uh, it's always wonderful to be back in, in Paris, but I especially wanted to thank uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Stéphane, for the incredibly warm welcome, but also the quality of the conversation that we had. Um, he covered most of what we've talked about. Let me just uh, add a couple of quick points of, of emphasis. On Ukraine, we discussed the imperative of continuing to support Ukraine so that it can effectively defend itself against the ongoing Russian aggression. Uh, that's for today. But also to make sure, through the work that we're doing, to help Ukraine build uh, a strong military for the future, to attract private sector investment so that it builds up its economy, and to continue to strengthen its democracy, in particular by moving down the accession path toward the EU, we are ensuring that we will have a Ukraine that stands strongly on its own feet, militarily, economically, democratically. And that's the single best response to Putin's aggression. France has been uh, a remarkable leader in this effort, both in making sure that Ukraine has what it needs to defend itself and also uh, working to set it up for the long term. Uh, it's been a leader in burden sharing. Billions donated in military and economic assistance to Ukraine, but also rallying other countries, using its leadership 
to bring others along. Uh, we also see this leadership in the enforcement of sanctions and export controls to limit Putin's war machine. Uh, we are working day in, day out uh, to effectively prevent the transfer of weapons and materials to Russia to fuel that war machine, uh, to fuel its defense industrial base, including from uh, Iran, from North Korea, and from China, something that we discussed today. This is not only a threat to Ukraine, it's actually a threat to European security as a whole. Uh, and so there's a strong interest uh, on the part of uh, France, on the part of all European countries, uh, to do everything we can to uh, prevent the ongoing bolstering of Russia's war machine. Uh, part of our shared challenge, too, is making sure that we are continuing to build up and energize our defense industrial base. Uh, earlier today, I had a chance to tour a factory where munitions are being produced. Um, these munitions, French munitions, American munitions, munitions coming from other parts of Europe and well beyond, have been absolutely essential in ensuring that Ukraine could stand up against the Russian onslaught. Um, we have to build uh, a stronger allied defense industrial base that's capable of meeting the challenges of today, but also future challenges. And that's also one of the reasons why it is essential that the United States Congress pass the President Biden's supplemental budget request as soon as possible, indeed, when it returns from its recess. That would further turbocharge our own defense industrial base while creating more good jobs in the United States. As Stefan said, we also spent some time talking about the Middle East. We've been grateful for France's partnership on the crisis in the Middle East and, indeed, working together to prevent uh, the conflict that we see in Gaza from spreading to other parts of the region. Both of us agree on the need to get uh, to the quickest possible ceasefire, to allow the release of hostages, to enable the surge and sustainment of humanitarian assistance. Uh, as I mentioned, we're coordinating closely when it comes to Lebanon and trying to prevent any spread of the conflict there, finding a diplomatic way forward. Um, we're also working together on creating a path to a more durable and lasting peace with security guarantees and political guarantees for Israelis and Palestinians alike. Let me also reiterate what Stefan said about the attack on the World Food Kitchen um, members, uh, World Central Kitchen, excuse me. Uh, first, uh, I can only say that for so many of us, um, we extend our condolences to the loved ones, to the families, the friends, the colleagues of those who lost their lives, as well as those who were injured. Uh, I spoke to Jose Andras just about uh, a week ago about the efforts that uh, World Central Kitchens engaged in in, uh, in Gaza, as it is in many other conflict zones the, around the world, including in Ukraine. Uh, they have been doing extraordinary, brave work, day in, day out, and critical work to try to make sure that people in need get what they need, starting with the most basic thing of all, food to survive. The victims of yesterday's strike join a record number of humanitarian workers who've been killed in this particular conflict. These people are heroes. They run into the fire, not away from it. They show the best of what humanity has to offer when the going really gets tough. They have to be protected. We shouldn't have a situation where people who are simply trying to help their fellow human beings are themselves at grave risk. Uh, we've spoken directly to the Israeli government about this particular incident. We've urged a swift, a thorough, an impartial investigation to understand exactly what happened. And as we have throughout this conflict, we've impressed upon the Israelis the absolute imperative of doing more to protect innocent civilian lives, be they Palestinian children, women, and men, 
or be they aid workers, uh, as well as to get more humanitarian assistance to more people more effectively. Uh, finally, let me just say that, as you heard from Stefan, we, we touched on a number of other uh, issues. I think what we see is uh, an extraordinary convergence between France and the United States on the major challenges of our time. We're cooperating together to try to ensure a free and open Indo-Pacific. That means a region where countries are free to choose their own path and their own partners, where problems are dealt with openly, where rules are reached transparently and applied fairly, where goods, ideas, people flow freely and lawfully. Uh, we're proud partners in the Paris Climate Summit, uh, including uh, joint efforts to advance civil nuclear energy as a greener alternative. Uh, finally, uh, let me just say how grateful we are as well to President Macron for his long-standing leadership on some of the most important cutting-edge issues of the day. Uh, for example, uh, all of the issues attendant to cyberspace, uniting governments, private sector, civil society, around rules of the road that reflect our shared values and our shared interests. It is, um, I think, very fitting that we are celebrating two landmark anniversaries this year. Uh, the 80th anniversary of the liberation that Stefan alluded to, as well as the 75th anniversary of NATO, the alliance, the defensive alliance that joins us together. In fact, the 80th anniversary of the liberation is a good reminder of why we decided a few years after the end of World War II, to come together in that defensive alliance, to help ensure that something like World War II would never happen again, to make clear that countries in the transatlantic space would look out for each other, have each other's backs, and in so doing, make it less likely that aggression uh, would occur. So there's a lot to look forward to in the uh, weeks and months ahead, even as we deal with the challenge of this moment, um, and I look forward to being back in France to do that. Thank you. Thank you. One question for media, please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Could Mr. you please Secret stand up, please? Of course. <laughs> don't, don't drop the laptop, John. Sorry about this. Very, very disorganized over here. Um, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, as the leader of the U.S. Department that has approved the transfer of the vast majority of the Israeli bombs dropped in this conflict, do events like the bombing of the World Central Kitchen Convoy give you pause about continuing the flood of U.S. weapons into Israel? And uh, a second question for both of you. Um, uh, uh, Secretary Blinken and Minister Sejourné, um, that there has been a rise of Ukrainian strikes on Russian oil refineries. Uh, the West is fairly united uh, in saying these strikes are justified. Uh, do you think hitting these facilities is the right strategic approach for Ukraine? Please. Uh, thank you, John. Let me take the uh, second question first. Um, it has uh, been our view and policy from day one when it comes to Ukraine to do everything we possibly can to help Ukraine defend itself against this uh, Russian aggression. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have neither supported nor enabled strikes by Ukraine outside uh, of its territory. Uh, with regard to arm transfers, look, I think it's very important to put this in its proper perspective and to understand what we're talking about. First, we have a long-standing commitment to Israel's security and to helping ensure its ability to defend itself. That's been a policy from administration to administration, Republican, Democrat, back and forth. Um, and indeed, that policy developed over many years, uh, developed into successive agreements between the United States and Israel long-duration agreements, um, 10 years in this case, to provide military assistance over that time frame to about uh, $3 billion a year. That's the system that's in place and it's long been in place. Uh, these arms transfers, every single one, 
happens consistent with statutory and policy requirements. That includes both informal and formal notifications uh, to Congress. Um, and it's what we do with every country with whom we have a defense relationship that involves the sale or transfer of arms. Um, now, the other important piece of context is this. With Israel, and this is also true with other countries, there are a number of open cases, uh, open requests of previously notified cases which have not been fully fulfilled or, or completed. Um, in the case of Israel, for example, there are many uh, requests that were made and were notified to Congress and agreed to that go back a decade or more. And it takes time often to produce the, um, the material or the weapons in question, uh, the parts, et cetera. Uh, these complex systems, simply put, can take years to uh, actually allow us to fulfill the, uh, the uh, request and the agreement. So many of the cases that you occasionally report on now underwent congressional review years ago and were notified years ago, well before the conflict in Gaza started. Well, let me, come, let me come to that because, again, all of this context is very, very important. Um, we, of course, also go out of our way to make sure that we're actually going above and beyond the law and what's required uh, in briefing Congress. Uh, we go to the relevant oversight committees. Uh, we make sure that they're aware of ongoing transfers above the statutory uh, threshold, even ones that they've approved a long time ago. Uh, and even when there's no requirement that there be additional notice uh, or uh, additional approval of any kind. Now, we've been focused on trying to make sure that October 7th can never happen again. Uh, and, but having said that, the security relationship we have with Israel is not just about um, Gaza, Hamas, October 7th. Um, it's also about the threats posed to Israel by Hezbollah, by Iran, by various other actors in the region, uh, each one of which has vowed, one way or another, to try to destroy Israel. So the weapons, the systems that Israel has sought to acquire, and as I said, have been contracted in many cases over many, many years, go to self-defense. They go to deterrence, trying to avoid more conflicts. They go to replenishment of, uh, of their supplies and their stocks. Um, so that's the system that's in place, has been in place for a long time, and one that continues. Now, as to the conflict in Gaza, um, from day one, we have worked to impress upon Israel the imperative of protecting civilians, of adhering fully to international humanitarian law, to the law of armed conflict. Uh, that is something that we uh, are looking at and review on a, on a regular basis, and that we're engaged with Israel on, on a regular basis, including as recently as yesterday when we met with, by video with the Israeli delegation. Merci. Je vais être assez, uh, Thank you. Clear and direct. I will be quite clear and direct as to the strikes by Ukraine against uh, Russian refineries. This brings almost no comment on our behalf. Uh, the Ukrainian people is acting in self-defense, and we consider that Russia is the aggressor. And in such circumstances, there is hardly anything to anything else to say. I think you understood me. A question from the French press. Good afternoon, um, um, Delphine Twitou, AFP. I have a question regarding the Israeli strike on the uh, consulate. A question for both of you. Um, so about the strike by Israel on um, Iran's consulate in Damascus. I'd like to know whether you fear any escalation in the region. And um, um, a follow-up question. Uh, given what happened in Gaza recently, um, did Israel go beyond um, some red lines? And what would be the red lines in Gaza or elsewhere? 
as to the way Israel is um, behaving at the moment. Let me start. To be extremely clear, the whole purpose of our action from the very beginning, and I believe the Secretary of State is in the same mindset, it is all about preventing escalation. That's the whole purpose of our action. And uh, there are a number of stakeholders who obviously are trying to expand the conflict in the north of Israel, um, in the Red Sea. We talked about it, and we already um, made comments on that uh, here. Um, the strikes against the United States in Syria and Iraq or elsewhere. So um, the escalation is entirely their responsibility. So I need not um, qualify things, but. I need to tell you that uh, the whole purpose of our action is to prevent this escalation, and we will accordingly uh, not comment on what happened. I can only say the same thing. We're, we're following the same approach. We're working very closely together to avoid an escalation, be it in Lebanon, in Iraq, or in Syria, or be it uh, in the Red Sea, or in Yemen. Etc. And with respect to the strikes in Syria, we are trying to ascertain the facts. We are in the process of uh, learning exactly what happened, and we are continuing to work uh, to understand the details. But we are working every day together, France and the United States, especially in Lebanon, to avoid that uh, there be a conflict between the parties, a conflict about which we are convinced neither the Israelis, neither Hezbollah, neither Lebanon uh, want, uh, or uh, neither Iran. One more question from the American press. Thank you. Uh, hi, Simon Lewis from, from Reuters. Um, I just firstly wanted to uh, come back to the issue of the World, uh, World Central Kitchen workers, the seven ki uh, workers who, who were killed by an Israeli strike. I had the honor of actually knowing one of them, uh, Zomi Frankom, hmm. um, and I can testify to her zest for life, kindness, um, and selflessness that we could see in the work that she was doing. Um, you know, this morning, I've seen an image of her Australian passport covered in blood. It's quite striking. Secretary Blinken, you've been warning for several months um, about the need for more humanitarian aid to get into Gaza. You recently talked about the near famine conditions there. This is the reason why these World, Food kitchen, World Central Kitchen uh, workers were there. Um, you've called for an investigation, but this isn't the first time that aid convoys have been hit. This isn't the first time that the Israelis uh, have been taking action that's restricted aid, uh, both going into the Gaza Strip and being distributed. Um, so I really wanted to ask, are you going to do more if this continues? Uh, this has continued for months. You know, is there more than you can do than simply raise these issues with the Israelis? And if their investigation comes back uh, with certain findings, you know, is there some action that the United States, as the main um, backer of Israel, is, is going to take regarding that? And secondly, um, France has proposed uh, a new UN Security Council resolution on Gaza that goes further than the one that uh, the US abstained on last month, calls for um, decisive and irreversible measures taken by parties towards a two-state solution. Uh, Secretary Blinken, you've called for a pathway to a two-state solution, a pan Palestinian state. So will you support such a resolution? Um, and to the foreign minister, um, regarding that resolution, have you, are you assured of having US support for that? The US has used its veto several times uh, since October uh, to block resolutions on Gaza. So would you call on Secretary Blinken to not use the veto in this case? Thank you. Uh, Simon, with regard to humanitarian assistance, um, going back to the very first trip that I made uh, to Israel after October 7th, a few days later, in every trip subsequent to that, um, I and uh, many others, uh, starting with President Biden, 
have worked to impress upon Israel the moral, the strategic, the legal imperative uh, of doing uh, everything possible to provide humanitarian assistance to people who need it. Uh, and of course, we've seen Israel take important steps over uh, the last uh, six or so months, whether it was opening Karem Shalom, uh, whether it was actually starting by opening the Rafah crossing to begin to allow assistance in, uh, Karem Shalom, uh, guaranteed fuel deliveries, um, flour through the Ashdod port, opening a new gate, 96 gate, just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, now the maritime corridor that many of us are working to, uh, to establish. They've taken uh, steps, but uh, it is, simply put, insufficient. Um, it is not enough to meet the needs of the children, the women, the men in Gaza who remain caught in a horrific crossfire of Hamas's making. So in our conversations with um, the Israeli government, including uh, just uh, last week when the defense minister was in Washington, and just yesterday when we were on a video conference uh, with um, Israeli counterparts, uh, we impressed, again, upon them the imperative of now surging and sustaining assistance, and not only getting it into Gaza, but within Gaza, getting it to everyone who needs it, including in the north, where, as you know, the conditions are the most challenged, and where World, World Central Kitchen uh, was laboring to get uh, assistance to people. So we and many others, including France, are intensely focused on this, uh, and we are looking very carefully to see that necessary steps are taken to uh, ensure that the assistance needed gets in and gets to people who need it. This also involves issues like much better coordination on the ground. We'll see what the investigation of the incident with World Central Kitchen uh, reveals. Uh, but coordination has been a, a perennial problem. Deconfliction, uh, as well as other challenges, destroyed roads, lack of trucks within Gaza, things of that nature that have to be remedied, as well as the access points um, into Gaza. Uh, having said all of that, I'm not going to get into uh, hypotheticals or get ahead of myself or get ahead of the, uh, of the administration. All I can tell you is this is an area of intense focus and absolute necessity. Um, when it comes to the uh, Security Council, uh, France and the United States work very closely together as permanent members on pretty much every issue that comes before the, the Council, including this one. And I look forward in the, the days and weeks ahead uh, to um, talking about uh, the, uh, the current effort, uh, other, uh, other efforts that may come forward. Uh, we share the same objectives. Um, I think, based on my conversations with Stefan, I think we both agree that um, getting uh, an immediate ceasefire to enable the release of hostages and the surging of humanitarian assistance would be the best next step that we could have to actually really change things on the ground. So we want to make sure that we're maximizing the efforts to do that. Negotiations uh, with regard to a ceasefire and the hostages are, are ongoing. Uh, we also agree that we have to find a path to a durable, lasting peace um, for Palestinians and Israelis alike. Uh, and we both agree that ultimately um, that, has to, that has to include the establishment of a Palestinian state with necessary security guarantees for Israel. So we're aligned on the, on the fundamentals, and we'll be talking in the uh, days and weeks ahead about uh, any of the measures that are before the Council. Et de notre côté, euh, nous avons déjà as far as we are concerned, we already um, a week ago commended the adoption of um, the resolution. And we, as a matter of fact, are calling on all parties to um, comply with its content. Otherwise, there is no international law anymore and uh, no multilateral solution. France, um, like you said, um, is also working on an initiative at the Security Council together with its partners, including the United States. Um, we're working on the parameters of the, uh, how to exit the crisis, including the political parameters. Of course, they're being discussed in different uh, fora within a number of diplomatic circles. 
uh, we're working on a two-state solution, all of the different possibilities of what could lead to um, an end to uh, this political crisis with the ceasefire and the arrival of humanitarian assistance and a political architecture that would um, enable to have security on both sides. Uh, we also, um, together with the Secretary of State, uh, talked um, um, of, um, about another point, and that was uh, the purpose of my visit uh, to Cairo on Saturday, um, where I met my Egyptian and Jordanian uh, counterparts, and in uh, Guyana as well, uh, we talked about the barriers and how to exit this crisis. And um, we will continue to talk to all the members of the Security Council and more broadly to the countries of the region. And we have the interest in the feeling that we can find a consensus as broad as possible for a sustainable way out of this crisis. And this uh, uh, require, will require the adoption of a new resolution. If there can be or if there shall be another way, and there will be, but such is what uh, this is what France is working on. One last question on behalf of um, the French press. Thank you, Philippe Ricard, Le Monde. About Ukraine, I'd like to know whether um, France and uh, the United States uh, um, now agree on the possibility of Ukraine uh, at some point uh, joining NATO. Of course, uh, that will be discussed in July at the NATO summit. And the question on um, Iran regarding Ukraine. Do you, uh, we feel there is an increasing, an increased, um, there are some increased concerns about uh, the delivery of weapons by Iran. Do you have any information um, on that? Like we said on the occasion of uh, the summit in Vilnius, um, I believe um, the member states of NATO um, share the same point of view. We are supporting uh, the reforms undertaken by Ukraine in order to join NATO, and we shall work in order to prepare um, this NATO summit, which shall be a summit of unity. This is important, and both France and the United States um, um, are attached to this um, unity on that point. So in the coming hours, in the coming weeks, I believe we will be um, uh, confirming um, this unity um, and we shall stick to the Vilnius formula, I believe. Yes, indeed. We did uh, talk about the NATO summit and Ukraine, and we'll talk about it much in much greater detail in the coming days in Brussels, Brussels during the NATO foreign ministers meeting. As the Allied stated in Vilnius, Ukraine will be member of NATO. Uh, for us, the issue is having a good and clear roadmap to reach this conclusion. And I believe that the NATO summit the, for the 75th anniversary will indeed be highly focused and quite concretely as to how we can establish this roadmap, or to use another image, the bridge, the necessary bridge to allow Ukraine to become a member of NATO. And with respect to Iranian missiles, which are being sent to Russia and are being used against the Ukrainian people. Indeed, we did mention it. We are working together to try to interrupt, at least penalize, any support of this nature, be it from Iran, North Korea, or elsewhere, including China. And this is also something that will be mentioned probably with our NATO colleagues in the coming days. Thank you, ministers. This was uh, the last question of this press conference. Thank you for attending. Thank you.